and Keith and certain other people figured out what to put in that sparkless bottle that would allow it to generate hydrogen gas. And so there was this reaction going on in this glass sparkless bottle. So then he fashioned a stopper with a pet cock and a tube, and you can now control the flow of hydrogen gas. And in those days, we had those clear plastic dry cleaning bags that came home with the dry cleaning, but they didn't have holes in them. And you could actually fill them with hydrogen gas. And then if you tie it on a rag that had been soaked in kerosene, you could release these things. No, no, no. They would be born in the basement, but then they would come. You could release these things at night and light the tail, and the altitude at which the whole thing would ignite depended on the length of the rag, because it took that time for the kerosene to burn up and then ignite in a blue fireball, sometimes about the size of this room. <laughs> For uh, Halloween, I don't know where Evan Jack were, <laughs> but he had built a railway. Down I had nothing to do with any of this. <laughs> he had built a railway, and the, the shopping cart, which figured heavily in our oh, yeah. lives, <laughs> was put to use for the probably hundredth time. And he had mounted a, a loudspeaker of this size, 12 inches at least, and had a wire running back to the breakfast room where he had his amplifier and his microphone. And he had put a big paper mache monster head on this thing. I'm getting this right, am I not? I think so. Yeah. And, and so when the... And then, so there's several friends involved in this. I don't think I was one of them at all. I'm sure you weren't. No. And down in the driveway was Mark Higgins and others. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and now you're naming them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anonymous people that bear no resemblance to anyone. And so the kids would come. Now we had to be careful with the little ones. We didn't want to do this to the little ones. So we did it. But the front door, as you all will recall, will, would creak as it opened the big front door. Double wide front door and it would have this wonderful creak like the Adams family house, you know. So the kids would ring the doorbell and the lights would go off. And the door would open, creaking very slowly. And then one of us would, I mean, sorry, somebody would push this shopping cart with the paper mache head in it and the light bulb inside it. And Keith would, in the breakfast room, yell into the microphone and this howling, scream! Okay, and all the kids would run out onto the lawn at which time. The plastic bags full of hydrogen gas would go off in a big giant blue car. And the kids were all in the street. I don't believe we made the papers on that one. But we, we did make the papers shortly thereafter, or maybe it was before, for getting these fireballs up high enough that people were calling the police department all over the town. And it did make it into the paper. As I recall, it was in, in, a, in, in truth, the highest glory was that it was the Pasadena Police Department, not the South Pasadena. <laughs> yeah, it, the yeah. yeah, it was an intercity event. <laughs> we got up. This was not the first time they came to the municipal upgrade. Uh -huh. <laughs> did, did they ever find out you were the one that did it? I don't think they can prove nothing. Nothing can be proved. And the statute of limitations has expired. We started out with fire balloons, and the leaves would go off. The fireball about this big, two tenths of a second. You just start to feel it. You put it under our shoe and go with a match, and it would just go calm. Humble beginnings. And the tenth went up like cherry bombs. Yeah, man. Now we had, we had and, the, and the police told us stop. We were out in the street with these shopping bags full of balloons. <laughs> hey, have you kids? Have you seen anything? Anybody with fire first? Oh, what's in the what's in the bag? No, oh, it's just balloons. Oh, fine. Fine. No problem. But that's not the story I wanted to tell. We had a tree house in an old persimmon tree that sat by the edge of the swimming pool. It was a beautiful old persimmon tree. It was a front runner like this. And we had built this tree house platform thing. Well, Keith had to have running water in his tree house. This was a requirement. And there was a like a 30-gallon trash can galvanized corrugated thing. And so we hauled it up into a crook of the tree that was above the tree house. And Keith had managed to take a, a hose bib that his dad had in the workshop and jam it into the base of this trash can and wrap it up with 
masking tape or something, I guess, and a little short piece of hose, and there was about. So then we took the garden hose and we put it into the trash can above our treehouse and proceeded to fill the trash can with 25 gallons, I think we made it to. And that's a lot of not, not knowing how much 25 gallons of water weighs exactly, but it's enough to split a persimmon tree <laughs> all the way to the ground, knocking it in half, white wood exposed, and dislodging in its fall enough mud to turn the entire Olympic-sized swimming pool completely brown. <laughs> At which time, Dad comes home from work <laughs> and sees his beautiful persimmon tree in ruin. The pool is the muddy Mississippi, and there Keith and I are standing. Oh crap! <laughs> Am I telling that correctly? <laughs> My dad was pretty cool about it. He said, "What? Well, I guess you've discovered how much water a gallon of water." <laughs> In our own way, we had discovered it. Pretty much practically dead anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to Not exactly what you call a surgical strike, but. <laughs> <laughs>